chapters 16 and 17 of the book of life by upton sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 16 the powers of the mind sets forth the fact that knowledge is freedom and ignorance is slavery and what science means to the people we have now completed a brief survey of the mind and its powers whatever we may have proved or failed to prove this much we may say with assurance the reader who has followed our brief sketch attentively has been disabused of any idea he may have held that he knows it all and this is always the first step towards knowledge the mind is the instrument whereby our race has lifted itself out of beasthood it is the instrument whereby we hold ourselves above the forces which seek to drag us down and whereby we lift ourselves higher if higher we are to go how shall we protect this precious instrument how shall we complete our mastery of it what are the laws of the conduct of the mind the process of the mind is one of groping outward after new facts and digesting and assimilating them as the body gropes after and digests and assimilates food the senses bring us new impressions and we take these and analyze them tear them into the parts which compose them compare them with previous sensations recognize difference in things which seem to be alike and resemblances in things which seem to be different we classify them and provide them with names which are as it were handles for the mind to grasp above all we seek for causes those chains of events which make what we know as order in the world of phenomena and when the mind has what it seems to be a cause it proceeds to test it according to methods it has worked out the rules and principles of experimental science it is a comparatively small number of sensations which the body brings to the mind of itself it is a narrow world in which we should live if our minds adopted a passive attitude toward life but some minds possess what we call curiosity they set out upon their own impulse to explore life they discover new laws and make new experiences and new sensations for themselves the mind forms an idea and at first after the fashion of the ancient greek philosophers it glorifies that idea and sets it in the seat of divinity but presently comes the empirical method which refuses authority to any idea unless it can stand the test of experiment and prove that it corresponds with reality nowadays the thinker amasses his facts and forms a theory to explain them and then proceeds to try out this theory by the most rigid method that he or his critics can devise if the theory doesn't work that is if it doesn't explain all the facts and stand all the tests it is thrown away like a worn-out shoe so little by little a body of knowledge is built up which is real knowledge which will serve us in our daily lives which we can use as foundation stones in the structure of our civilization by this method of research man is expanding his universe beyond anything that could have been conceived in the pre-scientific days hour by hour while we work and play and sleep the mind of our race is discovering new worlds in which our posterity will dwell for uncounted ages man walked upon the earth surrounded by infinite swarms of bacterial life of whose existence he never dreamed the invisible rays of the spectrum beat upon him and he knew nothing of what they did to him whether good or evil he lifted his head and saw vast universes of suns in comparison with which his world was a mere speck of dust and yet to him these universes were globes or lanterns which some divinity had hung in the sky one of the most fascinating illustrations of how the mind runs ahead of the senses is the story of the planet uranus which less than two hundred years ago had never been beheld by the eye of man a mathematician seated in his study working over the observations of other planets their motions in relation to their masses and distance 
discovered that their behavior was not as it should be. At certain times none of them were in quite the right place, and he decided that this variation must be due to the existence of an unknown body. He worked out the problem of what must be the mass and the exact orbit of this body in order for it to be responsible for the variations observed. And when he had completed these calculations, he announced to the astronomical world, turn your telescopes to a certain spot in the heavens, and at a certain minute of a certain night, you will find a new planet of a certain size. And so, for the first time, the human senses became aware of a fact which by themselves they might not have discovered in all eternity. Now, the importance of exact knowledge concerning a new planet may not be apparent to the ordinary man, and if the thing which is discovered is, for example, an unknown ray, which will move an engine or destroy a cancer, then we realize the worthwhileness of the research, and the masters of the world's commerce are willing to give here and there a pittance for the increase of such knowledge. But men of science, who have by this time come to a sense of their own dignity and importance, understand that there is no knowledge about reality which is useless, no research into nature which is wasted, you might say that to describe and classify the fleas which inhabit the bodies of rats and ground squirrels, and to study under the microscope the bacteria which live in the blood of these fleas, that this would be an occupation hardly worthy of the divinity that is in man. But presently, as a result of this knowledge about fleas and flea diseases being in existence and available, a bacteriologist discovers the secret of the dread bubonic plague, which hundreds of times in past history has wiped out a great part of the population of Europe and Asia. Mark Twain tells in his Connecticut Yankee how his hero was able to overcome the wizard Merlin, because he knew in advance of an eclipse of the sun. And this was fiction, of course, but if you prefer a fact, you may read in the memoirs of Houdin, the French conjurer, how he was able to bring the Arab tribes into subjection to the French government by depriving the great chieftains of their strength. He gathered them into a theater and invited their mighty men upon the stage, and there was an iron weight, and they were able to lift it when Houdin permitted, and not to lift it when he forbade. These noble barbarians had never heard of the electromagnet, and could not conceive of a force that could operate through a solid wooden floor beneath their feet. Such things, trivial as they are, serve to illustrate the difference between ignorance and knowledge, and the power which knowledge gives. The man who knows is godlike to those who do not know. He may enslave them, he may do what he pleases with their lives, and they are powerless to help themselves. Anyone who would help them must begin by giving them knowledge, real knowledge. There is no such thing as freedom without knowledge. And it must be the best knowledge. It must be new knowledge. He who goes against new knowledge, armed with old knowledge, is like the Chinese who went out to meet machine guns with bows and arrows, and with umbrellas over their heads. Once upon a time, knowledge was the prerogative of kings and priests and ruling castes. But this supreme power has been wrested from them, and this is the greatest step in human progress so far taken. Seek and ye shall find, is the law concerning knowledge today. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. In this, my book of the mind, I say to you that knowledge is your priceless birthright, and that you should repudiate all men and all institutions and all creeds and all formulas which seek to keep this heritage from you. Beware of men who bid you to believe something because it is told you, or because your fathers believed it, or because it is written in some ancient book, or embodied in some ancient ceremonial. Break the chains of these venerable spells, and at the same time beware of the modern spells which have been contrived to replace them. Beware of party cries and shibboleths, the idols of the forum, as Plato called them, the prejudices which are set as snares for your feet. 
beware of Kant, that paraphernalia of noble sentiments artificially manufactured by politicians and newspapers for the purpose of blinding you to their knaveries. Remember that you live in a world of class conflicts. At every moment of your life your mind is besieged by secret enemies. It is exposed to poison gas clouds deliberately released by people who seek to make use of you for purposes which are theirs and not yours. In the fairy tales we used to love, the hero was provided with magic protection against the perils of those times. But what hero and what magic will guard the modern man against the propaganda of militarism, nationalism, and capitalist imperialism? The mind is like the body, in that it can be trained, it can be taught sound habits. Its powers can be enormously increased. There are many books on mind and memory training, some of which are useful and some of which are trash. There is an English system widely advertised called Pelmanism, of which I have personally made no test, but it has won endorsements of a great many people who do not give their endorsements lightly. This is the subject of applied psychology, and just as in medicine, or in law, or in any of the arts, there is a vast amount of charlatanry, but there is also genuine knowledge being patiently accumulated and standardized. When the United States government had to have an army in a hurry, it did not make its millions of young men into teamsters or aviators at random. It used the new methods of determining reaction times and testing the coordination of mind and body. Recently I visited the Whittier Reform School in California, where delinquent boys are educated by the state. A boy had been set to work in a tailor shop, and it had been found that he was unable to make buttons and the buttonholes of a coat come in the right place. For nine years the state of California, and before it the state of Georgia, had been laboring to teach this boy to make buttons and buttonholes meet. The effort had cost some $5,000, to say nothing of all the coats which were spoiled, and all the mental suffering of the victim and his teachers. Finally, someone persuaded the state of California to spend a few thousand dollars and install a psychological bureau for the purpose of testing all the inmates of the institution. So by a half hour's examination, the fact was developed that this boy was mentally defective. Although he was 18 years old in body, his mind was only eight years old, and so he would never be able to achieve the feat of making buttons and buttonholes meet. This is a new science, which you may read about in Terman's The Measurement of Intelligence. By testing normal children, it is established that certain tasks can be performed at certain ages. A child of three can point to his eyes, his nose, and his mouth. He can repeat a sentence of six syllables, and repeat two digits, and give his family name. Older children are asked to look at a picture and then tell what they saw to note omissions in the picture, to arrange blocks according to their weight, to arrange words into sentences, to note absurdities in statements, to count backwards, and to make change. Children of fifteen are asked to interpret fables, to reverse the hands of a clock, and so on. Of course, there are always variations. Every child will be better at some kinds of tests than at others. But by having a wide variety and taking the average, you establish a mental age for the child, which may be widely different from its physical age. You may find some whose minds have stopped growing altogether and can only be made to grow by special methods of education. Enlightened communities are now conducting separate schools for defective children, replacing the old-fashioned schoolmaster who wore out the birch rods trying to force poor little wretches to learn what was beyond their power. In the same way, psychology can be applied in industry, and in the detection of crime. Here, too, there is a vast amount of fake, but also the beginning of a science. Our laws do not as yet permit the use of automatic writing and hypnotic trance in the investigation of crime, but they have sometimes permitted some of the simpler tests, for example, those of memory association. The examiner prepares a list of a hundred names of objects, and reads those names one after the other and asks the person he is investigating 
to name the first thing which is suggested to him by each word in turn. Engine will suggest steam, or perhaps it will suggest train. Coat will suggest trousers, or perhaps it will suggest pocket, and so on. The examiner holds a stopwatch and notes what fraction of a second each one of these reactions takes. The ordinary man, who is not trying to conceal anything, will give all his associations promptly, and the reaction times will be approximately alike. But suppose the man has just murdered somebody with an axe, and buried the body in a cellar with a fire shovel, and taken a pocketbook and a watch and a locket and a number of various objects, and climbed out of the cellar window by breaking the glass. And now suppose that in his list of a hundred objects, the psychologist introduces unexpectedly a number of these things. In each case, the first memory association of the criminal will be one which he does not wish to give. He will have to find another, and that inevitably takes time. One or two such delays might be accidental. But if every time there is any suggestion of the murder, or the method or scene of the murder, there's a notice confusion and delay, you may be sure that the conscious mind is interfering with the subconscious mind. The difference between the conscious and the subconscious mind is always possible to detect. And if you are permitted to be thorough in your experiments, you can make certain what is in the subconscious mind that the conscious mind is trying to conceal. Here, as everywhere in life, knowledge is power. And expert knowledge confers mastery over the shrewdest, untrained mind. The only trouble is that under our present social system, the trained mind is very apt to be working in the interest of class privilege. The psychologist who is employed by a great corporation or by a police department may be as little worthy of trust as a chemist who is engaged in making poison gases to be used by capitalist imperialism for the extermination of its rebellious slaves. But what this proves is not that scientific knowledge is untrustworthy, but merely that the workers must acquire it. They must have their own organizations and their own experiments in every field. To give knowledge to the masses of mankind, slow and painful as the process seems, is now the most important task confronting the enlightened thinker. The method of psychoanalysis gives us also much insight into the phenomena of genius, and the hope that we may ultimately come to understand it. At present, we are embarrassed because genius is so often closely allied to eccentricity. The supernormal appears in connection with the subnormal, and it is often hard to tell them apart. Great poets and painters, in revolt against the world of smug commercialism, adopt irresponsibility as their religion. They live in a world of their own. They dress like freaks. They refuse to pay their debts or to be true to their wives. They are followed by a host of disciples who adopt the defects of the master as a substitute for his qualities. And so there grows up a perverted notion of what genius is, and wholly false standards of artistic quality. There is nothing mankind needs more than sure and exact tests of mental superiority, not merely the ability to acquire languages and to solve mathematical equations, but the ability to carry in the mind intense emotions while at the same time shaping and organizing them by the logical faculty, selecting masses of facts and weaving them into a pattern calculated to awaken the emotion in others. This is the last and greatest work of the human spirit, and to select the men who can do it and foster their activity is the ultimate purpose of all true science. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 The Conduct of the Mind Concludes the Book of the Mind with a study of how to preserve and develop its powers for the protection of our lives and the lives of all men. Someone wrote me the other day asking, when is the best time to acquire knowledge? I answer, the time is now. It is easier to learn things when you are young, 
but you cannot be young when you want to be, and if you are old, the best time to acquire knowledge is when you are old. It is true that the brain cells seem to harden, like the body, and it is less easy for them to take on new impressions, but it can be done, and just as Seneca began to learn Greek at eighty, I know several old men whom the recent war has shaken out of their grooves of thought and compelled them to deal with modern ideas. But if you are young, then so much the better. Then the divine thrill of curiosity is keenest. Then your memory is fresh and can be trained. Your mind is plastic, and you can form sound habits. You can teach yourself to respect truth and seek it. You can teach yourself accuracy, open-mindedness, flexibility, persistence in the search of understanding. First of all, I think, is accuracy. Learn to think straight. Let your mind be as a sharp scalpel, penetrating unrealities and falsehoods, cutting its way to the facts. When you set out to deal with a certain subject, acquire mastery of it, so that you can say, I know. And yet, never be too sure that you know. Never be so sure that you are not willing to consider new facts, and to change your way of thinking, if it should be necessary. I look about me at the world and see tigers and serpents, dynamites and poison gas and forty-two centimeter shells. Yet I see nothing in the world so deadly to men as an error of the mind. Look at the mental follies about you. Look at all the prejudices, the delusions, the lies deliberately maintained, and realize the waste of it all, the pity of it all. Every man, it seems, has his pet delusions, which he hugs to his bosom and he loves, because they are his own. If you try to deprive him of those delusions, it is as though you tore from a woman's arms the child she has born. I have written a book called The Prophets of Religion, and never a week passes that there do not come to me letters from people who tell me they have read this book with pleasure and profit. They are grateful to me for teaching them so much about the follies and delusions of mankind. And it is all right and all true, and save for two or three pages, in which I deal with the special hobby which happens to be their hobby. And it is all right and all true, save for the two or three pages in which I deal with a special hobby which happens to be their hobby. What I say about all the other creeds is correct, but I fail to understand that the Mormon religion is a dignified, inspired religion, a gift from on high, and if only I would carefully study the Book of Mormon, I would realize my error. Or, it is all right except what I say about Christian scientists, or the theosophists, or perhaps one particular sect of the theosophists, who are different from all the others. Today there lies upon my book a letter Today there lies upon my desk a letter from a man who has read many of my books, and now is grief stricken, because he must part company from me, he discovers that I permit myself to speak disrespectfully about the Seventh-day Adventist religion, whereas he is prepared to show the marvels of biblical prophecy now achieving themselves in the world. How could any save a divinely revealed religion have foreseen the present movement to establish the Sabbath by law? Yes, and presently I shall see the last atom of the prophecy fulfilled. There will be a death penalty for failure to obey the Sabbath law. Cultivate the great and precious virtue of open-mindedness. Keep your thinking free, not merely from outer compulsion, but from the more deadly compulsions of its own making, from prejudices and superstitions. The prejudices and superstitions of mankind are like those diseased mental states which are discovered by the psychoanalyst, which he calls a complex in the subconscious mind, a tangle or knot, which is a center of disturbance, and keeps the whole being in a state of confusion. Each group of men, each sect or class, have their precious dogmas, 
their shibboleths, their sacred words and stock phrases, which set their whole beings aflame with fanaticism. They also have their phobias, their words of terror, which cannot be spoken in their presence without causing a brainstorm. At present, the dread word of our time is communist. You can scarcely say the word without someone telephoning for the police. And yet, when you meet a communist, what is he? A worn, fragile student who has thought out a way to make the world a better place to live in, and whose crime is what he tells others about his idea. Or perhaps you belong to the other side, and then the word of terror is the word capitalist. You meet a capitalist, and what do you find? Very likely you find a man who is kindly generous in his personal impulses, but bewildered, possibly a little frightened, and still more irritated and made stubborn. So you realize that nearly all men are better than the institutions and systems under which they live. You realize the urgent need of applying your reasoning powers to the problem of social reorganization. Cultivate also in the affairs of your mind the ancient virtue of humility. There is an old-time poem, which perhaps was in your school, readers. Oh, why should the spirit of mortal be proud? My answer is, for innumerable reasons. The spirit of mortal should be proud and must be proud because life throbs in it, and because life is a marvelous thing, and the excitement of life is perpetual. Yesterday I met a young mother, and of what avail is all the pessimism of the poets against the pride of a young mother? Oh, she cried, and her face lighted up with delight. He said, Goo! Yes, he said, Goo, and never since the world began had there been a baby which had achieved that marvel. Presently it will be, Look, look, he's trying to walk. Then he will be getting marks at school, and presently he will be displaying signs of genius. Always it will take an effort of the mind of that young mother to realize that there are other children in the world as wonderful as her own, and perhaps it will take many generations of mental effort before there will be young mothers capable of realizing that some other child is more wonderful than her child. In other words, it is by a definite process of broadening our minds that we come to realize the lives of others, to transfer to them the interest we naturally take in our own lives, and to admit them to a state of equality with ourselves. This is one of the services the mind must render for us. It is the process of civilizing us. And there is another, and yet more important task, which is to make clear to us the fact that we do not altogether make this life of ours. That there is a universe of power and wisdom which is not ours, but on which we draw. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, said the psalmist. We know now that fear is an ugly emotion, destructive to life, but it may be purified and made into a true humility which every thinking man must feel towards life and its miracles. Also, the man will have joy, because it is given to him to share the high, marvelous adventure of being. To the pleasures of the body there is a limit, and it comes quickly. But the pleasures of the mind are infinite, and no one who truly understands them can have a moment of boredom in life. To a man who possesses the key to modern thought, who knows what knowledge is and where to look for it, the life of the mind is a panorama of delight perpetually unrolled before him. To the minds of our ancestors there was one universe, but to our mind there are many universes, and new ones continually discovered. The only question is, which one will you choose? Will you choose the universe of outer space, the material world of infinity? Consider the smallest insect that you can see crawling upon the surface of the earth. Small as that insect is in relation to the earth, it is not so small by millions of times as is the earth in relation to the universe made visible to our eyes by the high-powered telescope, plus the photographic camera, plus the microscope. If you want to know the miracles of this world of space, 
read Arrhenius's The Life of the Universe, or Simon Newcomb's Sidelights on Astronomy. Suffice it here to say that we have a chemistry of the stars by means of the spectroscope, that we can measure the speed and direction of stars by the same means that we have learned to measure the size of the stars, and are studying stars which we cannot even see. And then along comes Einstein with his theories of relativity, and makes it seem that we have to revise a great part of this knowledge to allow for the fact that not merely everything we look at, but also we ourselves are flying every which way through space. Or will you choose the universe of the atom, the infinity of the material world, followed the other way, so to speak? Big as the universe is in relation to our world, and big as our world is in relation to the insect that crawls on it, the insect is bigger yet in relation to the molecules which compose its body, and these in turn are millions of millions of times bigger than the atoms which compose them. And then, behold, in the atom there are millions and millions of electrons, tiny particles of electric energy. We cannot see these infinitely minute things any more than we can see the electricity which runs our trolley cars, but we can see their effects and we can count and measure them, and deal with them in complicated mathematical formulas, and be just as certain of their existence as we are of the dust under our feet. If you wish to explore this wonderland, read Duncan's The New Knowledge, or Dr. Henry Smith Williams' Miracles of Science. Or will you choose the universe of the subconscious, our racial past locked up in the secret chambers of our mind, or will you choose the universe of the superconscious, the infinity of genius manifested in the arts? By the device of art, man not merely creates new life, he tests it, he weighs it and measures it, he tries experiments with it, as the physicist with the molecule and the astronomer with light. He finds out what works and what does not work, and so develops his moral and spiritual muscles, training himself for his task as a maker of life. Written words can give but a feeble idea of the wonders that are found in these enchanted regions of our minds. Here are palaces of splendor beyond imagining. Here are temples with sacred shrines and treasure chambers full of gold and priceless jewels. Into these places we enter as Aladdin in the ancient tale. We are the masters here, and all that we see is ours. He who has once got access to it, he possesses not merely the magic lamp, he possesses all the wonderful fairy properties of all the tales of our childhood. He is the Tarnhelm, and the magic ring which gives him power over his foes. His is the sword Excalibur, which none can break, and the silver bullet which brings down all game, and the flying carpet upon which to travel over the earth, and the house made of gingerbread, and the three wishes which always come true, and the filter of love, and the elixir of youth, and the music of the spheres, and who knows? Some day he may come upon heaven, with St. Peter and his golden key, and the seraphim singing, and the happy blessed conversing. End of chapter 17 End of the Book of the Mind End of section 9